Art and Nadia for joining us. I'm going to hand this over to Mr. Sale, who's going to kind of serve as our moderator. I'm going to be the person bringing up all the visuals. Hopefully I'll get it all right this time. So uh, Art and Nadia, without further ado, thank you for joining us. We're pleased to have you. Okay, if everybody will uh, mute right now uh, so that Art and Nadia will be able to uh, uh, make a presentation. They are representing uh, Faith in Action. Uh, Faith in Action, as you uh, uh, know, we are a part of it among the 20 some congregations uh, in the Harrisonburg area, uh, working together to uh, uh, give a common voice to faith and uh, addressing issues within our community. And I don't want to go too far uh, along that line. As Nadia has already said, she is a, a representative from the mosque and our Muslim community. And Art is the communicator. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what his title is, but Art is the part-time staff person for uh, Faith in Action. He's the one who keeps Faith in Action focused as well as uh, speaks for it. So we've got two wonderful speakers here uh, for Faith in Action, both to uh, present what's going on as well as to respond to questions. So what I'm planning to do is right now is to turn it over to Nadia and Art uh, and let them make a presentation and then we will have a time for questions, uh, which uh, I'll kind of moderate. So I'm not sure who's going first, Nadia or Art, but uh, you guys are on now. All right. Thanks, Sandy. Um, and why don't we start, Nadia, why don't we start by introducing ourselves and sort of what brings us to this. So if you want to do that, Nadia. Okay. Um, well, like I said earlier, um, I am with Faith in Action. I'm a representative of the Islamic Association. And um, I've been with Faith in Action for three to four years now. I don't know if this past year counts or not. It's just been such a crazy year. I don't want to count it. <laughs> but um, there... Um, I also um, have a small business out in the county in Dayton. Um, and I started with Faith in Action when they were with their criminal justice campaign. Um, very interested in that. And then I was asked to be the campaign, um, campaign committee chair. So I took on that role um, around this time last year. And um, since then, we have been working on affordable housing for Harrisonburg and Rockingham. Um, and that's what I do with Faith in Action. So go ahead, Art. Thanks, Nadia. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, there's some familiar names and faces on, on this call. So thank you for the invitation and Bill for setting this up and making the connections to, to this group. Um, my name is Art Stolstus. I'm a part-time staff person with um, Faith in Action. And what brings me to this work is sort of integrating my faith with um, with works of justice in our community, and really, what motivates me is my family. Um, I was part of an interracial marriage, and all my children are African American. And part of what motivates my work here is the what's what's um, our world, what's our community is going to look like for my grandchildren as they as they grow up, hopefully it's going to be slightly different and they can live in a, little, a slightly more just world than what, what it is right now for many of our African-American brothers and sisters. So that's what brings me to this, to this work. So we're, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about faith in action, background, who we are. Nadia then will talk a little bit about the housing campaign and Mary is going to help us with all of the things that we need to do of sharing screens and whatnot. So Mary, if you can, are you able to pull up the PowerPoint? Sorry, laptop's being a little slow this morning. Give me a moment, please. Okay. Okay, let me know when I need to advance. Okay, well, you can advance to the next screen. Well, if I can figure out how to do it. Sorry, folks. Like I said, I'm new to this. There you go. So um, I'm going to. 
So this is the this is who we are. It's people of faith working together for greater justice in Rockingham County and Harrisonburg. So we work with congregations both in the city and in the county. So any of the work that we're doing is going to be focused in both areas, not just in one. So it, which makes it very interesting work of working in a city and the politics and how things get done in the city that also in the county and how work gets done in the county. Um, next, next slide. So our work is draws, um, it draws congregation. What we do is we're congregational based organizing, which is working within congregations and working with people of faith in struggles for justice. And that's part of part of many of our traditions going back hundreds and thousands of years. Um, we, draw on the we draw on the biblical scripture, uh, Christ's life and teaching, the Torah, the Quran, and founding principles of the American democracy and US civil rights movement. So we're a multi-faith um, organization. Um, we welcome uh, congregations of all faiths. Um, our work primarily focuses on our, the issues of justice, um, but we certainly welcome people of, broad, of the, the, uh, very different faiths in our community. Next, next slide. Um, above all, our work begins and ends with an expression of our personal faith and values of its members. So one of the scriptures that, that, that for me is, uh, is significant is Isaiah 117. Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed. And um, so that's part of what brings me to this, to this work. Um, and each of the people who are involved in congregations, they may have different things that bring them to the, bring, different ideas that bring them to the work. Uh, but we, once, once there, we work together around these specific issues. Next slide. These are our sort of guiding values as an organization um, that keep us focused on, on what we're doing, reflect and respect diversity, learn and lead in joyful partnership, communicate clear vision and plans, strengthen congregation and community networks, connect our faith traditions with local justice concerns, and then finally act together for justice. Next slide. We're currently 23 congregations. Um, and you can see the list here. It goes from, from the parish, from Blessed Sacrament Parish to the temple, um, to the mosque to the various the various denominate other denominations within our Christian denominations within our community. One of the things, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit, is we we were beginning to affiliate with a national organization called the Industrial Areas Foundation. And they're encouraging us to continue our work with congregations and part of and then but also begin thinking about what are the other trusted institutions in our community? Um, you know, so our congregations are trusted parts of our community, but what are these other organizations? Is it the schools? Um, is it higher ed? Are there or other organizations in our community that P uh, PTAs that people are looking to and people trust in the community and begin thinking about what a partnership with those organizations could also look like? Next slide. And this is what we do. Um, we start by doing a listening process within our congregations and within our communities. And typically that's done through one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's beginning to build relationships within our congregations and within our community and hearing from people, what is their story? What do they care deeply about? Um, what's going on in their families? What's impacting? What is impacting their families that um, in this moment? And then once we that's done, then we bring all of those 
concerns or those issues that have surfaced in those one-on-one -on -one conversations to a larger gathering of all the congregations. So all 23 congregations through their representatives would bring those to a, a larger assembly. And then over, over a process of one or two meetings, we'll go through a process and determine, well, what is, what is the issue that seems to be surfacing and that we all can live with working together on? And last time we gathered, which was a year ago in September, um, there were 17 different issues that people brought from mental health to transportation um, to housing. So there was just a wide number of issues. And then we eventually settled on affordable housing. So what we do is then once as an organization, we decide on a specific issue, then and Nadia will explain this more, we begin doing research what is going on in our community around that issue? Who are the other people whose mission is to work on that specific issue? And so how do we connect to those folks that are already working on this? And plus, how do we connect to the people who are most impacted and, by, and hearing their stories? Because once we hear those stories, then that begins to give us more focus to, to what we're doing. So we do the research, understand who's working at it, what are the impacts, and then we begin to think about, okay, well, how do we impact that issue? Pre up to this point, we've been looking at how we can impact that issue here in our community. But one of the things that we're learning is that while we can have impact in our community, we also have to have impact. Some of the things that we're doing also need to have a state response and can only be changed as we begin looking at this state assembly and some of the issues that are surfacing there. So I think as the, as the years go along, we're gonna begin expanding some of the things that we're thinking about. It's not only here in our local area, but then also thinking about well, how do we impact this at the state level? Because the state has also has a significant impact. And then once we focus on that, we figure out our action. We develop different strategies around that action to make sure that that be it becomes a reality. And then we evaluate and reflect, what do we do well? What did we not do so well? What did we learn about that? How do we demonstrate our power? and how do we keep um, our public officials accountable for those changes. Uh, next, next screen. So thus far, the three, we, we started in 2015. In 2016, we started, first, we started our first campaign around justice for our immigrant neighbors. And the thing that came out of that was the welcoming Harrisonburg Council here in the, in, in the city. And then the second campaign was local criminal justice reform. Um, and the, what, we, what was one out of that was to have the city and the county to go together to hire a community justice planner that would look at what's going on in our community, both city and county, and try to understand what's working well and what's not working well and how we, what, what are the things that we need to focus on to have, have less people being incarcerated and to have less recidivism and to look at how we're using our resources as a community. And then thirdly, one of the things that's sort of been woven into our work is some, some work that uh, we've been fortunate to connect with is the Racial Equity Institute. And they've been very instrumental in helping us understand of how racism is embedded in the very systems of every community, be it education, healthcare, housing, and be understanding that dynamic as we're continuing to work on, on this work. And so that, that's been very another helpful part for our congregations is to understanding that embedded systemic racism that's already present in our community and how that's how that impacts people. Next screen. So earlier, um, 
this, and Nadia, this is my last slide and it's gonna to shift to you. Um, in June of this year, the congregations agreed to affiliate with a national entity called the Industrial Areas Foundation. Up to this point, up to June of this year, Faith in Action has been an independent, I don't know if independence is the right word, but has been working, you know, doing the best, doing, doing our work and not connected to a national network. One of the things we recognize, particularly during the criminal justice campaign, is while we were successful in doing some of the work, we were not successful in doing all of the work. And so we began thinking about how do we build faith in action to, so it has more power to make greater change in our community. And the leadership and the congregations of Faith in Action decided that we need to affiliate with a national organization. And primarily to get, to get good training for both clergy and lay leaders that are part of Faith in Action. So they, the understanding of uh, congregational-based organizing, how you build power within your congregation, within the community. And so the training was important. Third, uh, in addition, getting the mentoring. Um, I think we did some things well, and I think there's other things we could have done better. And so the mentoring, somebody who can we can check in with to say, We're, this, is our, this is our work now. How can we think about this? How can we do this better? And then the other, the other part of this is a, we, we have an, a partnership with a group called Voice. It's called Virginia or, Virginians Organized for Interfaith Community Engagement. They are a group very similar to Faith in Action, but they're in northern they're in the northern part of Virginia, and have been at this much longer um, as a as an organization. And they have agreed to partner with us over the next year to help build our build our or to rebuild our organization to strengthen faith in action. And one of the things that impressed me, we've been on a number of Zoom calls with them as they've been working on issues in Northern Virginia, but also at the state level, is the voice of the clergy in that organization. The clergy are the voices that you hear, uh, the voices that the relationships that, that the clergy has in the community are really important to build. And so that's been an impressive part of that. They've been very, just in the last few months, instrumental in getting the more, extending the moratorium on evictions in our community, uh, in, in Virginia to the end of the year. And uh, so they've had a number of significant successes. And so they've been very, they're an affiliate of IAF as well. So they're bringing their expertise here to our community. Um, about a week and a half ago, we had an event where we gathered clergy on Sunny Slope Farm. It was a beautiful day under a tent with wind, breezes going through. But what was so impressive to me was the, was the, we had clergy from Northern Virginia that were here, at United Church of Christ, a Baptist minister, uh, a member of the mosque that came out and just talked talk to us about what it meant for them to work together, some of the victories that they've been able to achieve, and why this matters in their congregations. And that was really good for, for, for all of us to hear, but particularly our clergy leaders in our community. So our goals for the next year in this partnership is by September of 2021, uh, we want to have an assembly with 500 people. And the, at this, in September of next year is going to be the governor's race. Uh, we're, we're, we'll be hoping to have all the gover governor, go gubernatorial candidates present uh, or that we can present what we've learned and what are the concerns of the people in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, secondly, training of 100 leaders, you know, that's already begun. We want to have a thousand relational meetings. That's already begun to hear people's stories. What do people care about? What do they? What What are they passionate about? 
in their community and how does that impact their, their ministry? How does that impact how they go about their life? What do they wish for in our community? And then lastly, we are currently at 23 organizations to increase our, increase our number of organizations to 30. And the, the one thing that both IAF and VOICE has really emphasized is our power comes from organized people and then secondly, organized money. And so organized people is by turning out people for that assembly in September of 2021, increasing the number of organizations. But we're also in the midst of a, a, a fundraising campaign to raise enough to raise 75,000 so that we can hire a full-time organizer that can take our work to the next level. So that's kind of where we are, are what, how we've been shaped and where we are currently. So I'll turn it over to Nadia to talk a little bit about the housing campaign. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Mary, for handling the slides. No <laughs> if worries. You can, if you can go to the next slide, thanks. So um, as I said, this year, we this past year, we've been working on affordable housing. Um, and that's both in the city and county. Um, these are actually a list of our three asks, but before I get on that, and Art, forgive me, I know we're a little pressed for time here, but I do want to go on a small tangent. Um, so as a small business owner, I um, have always, you know, worked with employees, with, um, with working with employees, with um, helping them find housing, uh, with whether it's new employees or employees that are looking to move. Um, and, you know, I would help them do an online search and try to find something. And it was always frustrating um, to find something that's affordable, that's within the number of bedrooms that they'd like, um, and that has the utilities that they're looking for. And at first, I thought that was kind of like a, just an internal frustration, a couple people. And I didn't think much of it other than, well, let's just keep searching and let's see what else we can do. Um, I do have one employee uh, who lives out in Bridgewater in a small two bedroom apartment and she's paying over $200 in utilities, which I found outrageous. So I said, well, let's, let's see what we can do to help you with here and there with, and with bills and was trying to find maybe another place that could be more affordable. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we say affordable, but um, my appreciation for faith in action was it took me to the level of helping you know, the small circle that I was in working with the employees, uh, trying to help um, whether it was them or their family members or my own family members in finding housing. But it took me from that frustration of that and finding out that I could do something um, at a systemic level uh, rather than just within my own small inner circle. Um, so I realized, well, if more people than I am are having this frustration with housing, then what can we do as a community? Where do our values lie? And that we can change um, this frustration that we're having. Um, so as I said, that, that's kind of my appreciation with Faith in Action is that we can reach out to our civic leaders. Um, as Art said, now we're working, we're trying to go more on a state level and with national affiliates so we can reach out further than our own uh, city and county. Um, so I wanted to start off with that, just saying my appreciation there and and just the work that we can do um, and just kind of expand our circles um, and realize that we can, our, and, and as Art said before, with our faith driving us, with our own personal faith driving us to have this kind of change and, and, and um, working with social, social justice issues. Uh, so back to our campaign, um, we decided that we would ask our civic leaders for three things. Um, the first being that the city and county would jointly fund and administer a housing trust fund. Um, now, housing trust fund, uh, a lot of people confuse it with the community land trust, um, but a housing trust fund is pretty much um, a fund that would come together with money from, um, from the city and county. Um, it would come from uh, private donors, it would come from um, businesses, the large businesses that we have, um, and that includes JMU and Centera and places like Cargill, um, just those that have some kind of that 
have what's the word or just some type of um <laughs> Self-interest. Self self-interest. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> I knew you would have it. Uh, but sometimes self-interest in helping their community. And again, um, just what, what our values are within this community. Um, it's the affordable housing. It's, it's helping those um, that are struggling, which I'll get into that population um, in the upcoming slides. But um, the, the second ask that we are looking for is what I said for that funding. So uh, we're asking for 750,000 from each the city and county. Um, and this would just help do the um, basic fundamental things that we're looking for. So this could, a housing trust fund um, could help with weatherization. It could help with emergency shelters. It could help with um, new development of, of housing uh, where new developers and contractors could come in and use this fund. And the way that it would be um, administered was is through a housing advisory committee. So they would list those priorities that we need in our local communities, what our local community is looking for. Um, whether it's right now, Open Doors is, is working on the shelter. Um, perhaps that some of the funds could go that way and, and just whatever our, you know, that list of priorities are. And again, it would be locally. Um, so if you can go to the, Next slides. So, yeah, that's that's the basics of a of the housing trust fund. Um, so, when we were working on this for the past year, we were looking at um, evictions, and we realized that within our city um, and county, because that's they're combined in our court system, um, that between 2018 and 2019, evictions rose like 17 or 18%, which we were like, whoa, that's crazy. But then COVID hit and it was a whole nother level. <laughs> um, thankfully the courts closed. Um, so there wasn't um, too many evictions happening, but there was a real struggle and people trying to come up with, um, with the funds for uh, whether it be rent or food or just the, the resources they need for survival. Um, so there were 12,000 eviction cases in Virginia for this, in July uh, when the when the court started opening back up. Um, now I know that's been extended until December and that was um, I think joint when we worked with Voice and IAF and working with uh, we got to speak with the governor. Um, so we spoke with Mark Warner. We spoke with Tim Kaine um, and Mark Herring um, and just the people that we could reach out to to say, we need to help these people now. We need to help these families now before they are out on the street during a pandemic. Um, and then what we realized um, with COVID as well as with housing is that um, the people of color and community of color are are the most likely to be evicted and um, and deal with these issues. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so let me actually start with, um, if you could pull up the video, Mary, for, um, for evictions and working with Winnie. Um, and while you pull that video up, uh, Wynette actually is on the board of OCP. Um, she's a longtime resident of the area and um, she just kind of talks about her story here about looking for affordable housing. And when I say affordable housing, I am talking about um, using 30, over 30% 30 of your income for housing and, and utility costs. So that's the HUD definition for affordable housing. Nadia, um, sorry to interrupt. Did you want the housing challenges one or the homeless shelters one? The first one. Okay. That just tells me what I need to know. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear that? Affordable housing was chosen by our covenant representatives. It was something that we could, we felt like we could all work on together. We know that there is such a big housing crisis in this area in both Harrisonburg and Rockingham. 60% of 
um, in the city and 40% of the residents in the county are spending above their budget, which is thir over 30% of their income on their housing, which is not something that is sustainable because it is taking away from their funds that could go towards childcare, healthcare, and, and other needs. My name is Winnie Dickerson. I've lived in Harrisonburg, Virginia for roughly um, 40 some years. I did live in Tidewater for 12 years after going to Old Dominion University and then moved back here to raise my family. Growing up in Harrisonburg, I said I would never, I couldn't wait to get out of here. I did not see people that looked like me. And so when, one of the real main reasons I ended up going to ODU is because there were more brown people <laughs> down there. I can remember getting out of the car saying, I see black people. And I was had so happy, you know. And as time changed, years went on, Harrisonburg became more diverse, became more brown, became more cream colored, as I like to call it. And my son is mixed, so I wanted him to see other people that look like him. I didn't want him to be feel like I felt growing up. So I felt comfortable with coming back here. I mean, that was a, that, that added the dot to my eye to say, you know, come on back home. Um, because the, the whole populace had changed and I was happy. Unfortunately, the systemic part of it has not so much changed. Um, when I can go into city offices or a number of buildings and I don't see a brown face that's not welcoming to me. Because I remember when that some things have changed but some things still remain the same. It's like the majority of the black people live in the Northeast community. A lot of the places where they want to put the affordable housing is in the Northeast community. I had moved back. My mother had passed away. I moved in with my into my mother's place with um, my brother. Then my son graduated from college. He moved in with us and, you know, um, was working on a job for six months. Never got paid. That's another story. So I'd follow behind on my bills, on my rent. And I told her, I said, hey, come April 1st, you know, you guys have been wonderful. I'm gonna move out. COVID hit. I have an underlying condition. I can't find a place. I had found a spot, but for some reason, they stopped returning my calls. Found another place, sent an email, talked to the, the man, he stopped returning my So I didn't have a place, and I was just really scared about going out. I mean, I knew nothing about this disease. I just knew that if you had an underlying condition that you're more susceptible. So I'm just scared. And finally I told, you know, my landlord was like, okay, it's April 1st, you need to get out. I was like, um, no. I was like, I'm afraid not. Governor Northam says, do not leave. You know, you guys have to quarantine and so. And I went through that whole, you know, thing with them. They were leaving me nasty notes, um, calls. I finally ended up going through um, Blue Ridge Legal. I had, you know, the stress of COVID, stress of being, possibly being evicted. You know, it was just nowhere to go. And I, I, I was emotional and cried over the fact that here I am on the board at OCP where I helped the homeless. And I was getting ready to join the, the population. And then as this, COVID has progressed and I see how it's attacking brown and black people. It just, it's, it's even more frightening. And that all is systemic too, because where we had to live and health care and all that, that's, it just all falls into that whole sphere of just systemic racism. I would like to see the city of Harrisonburg and Rockingham County jointly fund and administer a housing trust fund because it can only be spent on affordable housing. We can find ways of finding emergency shelters, cooperative housing for rental assistance. It could be for a community land trust, all things that we definitely need in our community. This is just one way that we can have the funds to access all of that. It could be something that our local service providers use as well as developers and contractors in order to develop 
new affordable housing and preserve the existing housing that we have. So as far as preservation, we could be doing housing repairs, emergency repairs, weatherization and making sure that people have adequate housing that they deserve. Thank you, Mary. Um, how are we doing with time? I know I, we do want to take some questions. Um, so I just didn't know if you wanted to end right at 12 or how your timing usually is. So sorry, folks. Trying to multitask here. Um, we have about eight minutes left. Mm -hmm. It's 11.52 right now. So how would you guys like to proceed? All right, I'll, I'll moderate this. Uh, if somebody has questions or comments, uh, interest, uh, just uh, raise your hand and I'll recognize you and then you uh, address your questions to either Art or Zanadia. So I will, if you don't mind, Andy, if I just add one thing, um, because they were on the slides, um, the upcoming slides. Um, so our focus right now is working with the Alice population, which is the asset limited income constrained and employed population. Um, in the city, you're looking at about 65% of the residents. County is about 35%. That's a very large number, especially in Virginia. Um, so that's why we're working on a campaign like this. Um, and that's what we've been doing the past year. We've been working with Mercy House, Salvation Army, a lot of the service providers, because all of those service providers will get the help from this housing trust fund. So they're backing us up on this full heartedly. Um, so we're hoping to get this passed um, in the next couple months with passing a resolution in, this, in the city and county. Uh, so we've been talking to those civic leaders about passing a resolution and then um, starting on the work of funding yeah. that housing trust fund. Um, I did have, there are some more videos that we have um, and you can check them out on Faith in Action Harrisonburg on YouTube. If you just Google Faith in Action Harrisonburg, you'll see some more of our videos. Um, one of our videos, um, that congregational rep has recently passed away, but she had a very impactful story that I'd love for you guys to hear that we just don't have the time to, to share with you guys today. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm ready for questions. Her name is Jody, um, by the way, if you wanna look up her videos. Sorry, Hi. Andy. Let me start with a question to you, the uh, uh, the fund, the trust fund. Now, is that going to be used for supplementing income, uh, supplementing uh, rent, or is it going to be used for trying to develop uh, housing uh, units that are affordable? Both. Um, it'll be whatever that housing advisory committee um, believes is on their list of priorities that our community needs. Um, that's what the focus will be on, but that's why we're asking for such a large number, uh, a large sum of money from the city and county and from other investors, um, because it's something that could go to numerous avenues. So, yes, and so the, the goal is to expand the amount, preserve and expand the amount of affordable housing. So, for example, like Habitat for Humanity is looking to do uh, a development in Harrisonburg but they have to factor in like the tap-in fees for utilities into their whole cost. And something like this could be put into their, their budget to keep, to, to cover those costs so that they, it keeps their, their housing more affordable. Okay, other questions? Well, let me, let me ask another question. I know uh, during this past, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, a lot of uh, $100,000 roughly was raised for immigrant uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, were in response to uh, the COVID-19. Uh, and a lot of that money went for rent uh, uh, until, of course, the extension uh, came through. I saw you said $1,000 a month. There's only 11 units. Now, is that $1,000 a month or is that $1,000 a year or, or, or what? Because uh, 11 units, that's that's not very money, many. Right, and that's the struggle that we're having in Harrisonburg is the stock um, in number of houses. So the struggle is there just aren't enough, especially with one bedroom apartments that a lot of the homeless are looking for or the, or the disabled 
um, or the elderly are looking for. Um, so they're not looking for a three or four bedroom, just something small that they can afford. Um, and um, sorry, now I forgot your question because I went off. It's a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. Right. So uh, that thousand is the amount of their rent. Um, per month or, or per for the app? Yes. So, quick. so Andy, the, one of the issues is, is that is, is it's a that's a it's a thousand a month. That's like the average rent cost per month. Because so there's just not enough yeah. units available. And then you know Nadia was talking about this Alice population. These are the people that are working at the hospitals, at JMU services, at the poultry plants. And basically the Alice population is living month to month just to cover their costs because their incomes aren't sufficient enough to when you're paying a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a month for a housing unit. So this is like a piece. I mean, it's certainly not going to cover everything, but creating more affordable units certainly is a need in our community. And the trust fund is basically a tool that would help the city and county um, just focus on this affordable housing. So that fund would only be towards these affordable housing needs. Other questions? Andy, yeah. if you don't mind me yeah. answering, um, I think I already know the answer to this, but how does having a very a fairly significant college student population in the city impact affordability? Um, so it definitely increases the market value. Um, and that's the struggle that um, places like the housing authority is having in finding housing is that their voucher program goes along with fair market value um, and land, um, sorry, landowner or, I'm forgetting my words today, I'm sorry. <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> I'm used to working Monday through Friday. <laughs> that's when my brain works. Um, but, um, <laughs> So, so yeah, go ahead, Art. I know you want to. Let yeah. me jump in and, and then Nadi, you can come back. So <laughs> J, JMU houses about a quarter of their population, of their student population on campus. The rest of it is, the rest of the population is off campus that is housed by, their, their, it's non-JMU owned properties. And so from that perspective for private entities and landlords, it is much more profitable to rent per bedroom, per bedroom. So they'll rent 350, 400, 450 per bedroom. Um, and that's much more profitable than renting to a family for 800 or $1,000. And so that it, it really puts incredible pressure on people who are in this Alice population, you know, how, where they're going to find it. So it's a significant, it's in the city, but mo a lot of their new developments, you know, it's going out into the county as well. So it's kind of, it, it, go, it hits both, both entities. But it's a, it's, that's, a prior, that's a significant driving force to the unaffordability of housing in our community. Yeah, I was really struck when, um, the company that owns the property on, on which Regal Theater sits, that they're going to raise and build a multi-use facility. And they specifically mentioned student housing. And I thought, that's fairly walkable for somebody who just wants to be able to walk to the grocery store. Yep. Yep. But that. So yeah. as a community, that's what we need to fight against. And that's where we need to fight our, find our voice and coming together. And when Art talks about just like this, the power of us coming together as a community and being that driving force and letting our leaders know you're representing the community, you're representing us. You need to do what we would like to see in our community and what our values are. Um, not just, and I know Jamie brings in a lot of money, that's great, but we need to think about our, our community as a whole and those that are struggling. As Art said, our, our single moms, our teachers, our uh, police officers, all of that, we don't need them to, to find, to drive in from Stanton and Augusta County just to come to work here. Um, we need to figure out how to, to help our own community. Yeah, and you're, you're going up against uh, a very powerful real estate uh, uh, 
what shall I say, powerhouse, uh, right. both county and city, uh, that are thriving, quite frankly, thriving in this situation. Bureaucracy. Yeah, bureaucracy. Okay, I, I see the old clock on the wall has uh, kind of said it's time to thank you all very much, Art and Nadia. It's good to see you again, Nadia, and, and see you again, Art, uh, both. And uh, Mary, do you want to say anything in closing? Um, only that I don't have my notes um, as to who our speakers are for next week because I closed down all my windows. So, um, but I'm sure that'll be in our weekly email. Uh, so just feel free to meet us back here after worship next week. And I appreciate everybody's patience with me and have a wonderful week, everyone. Really enjoyed this, folks. Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you yeah, so much. Me, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to invite Nadia and Art if you come to our uh, All Saints thing this afternoon, if you guys want to come, we'd love to have you.